So welcome to lecture 35 of MCS 471. Uh, it's an introduction to numerical analysis. And today we continue our exploration, our introduction into two-point boundary value problems. Um, it's also our last lecture on uh, boundary value problems. So we will apply uh, the finite element method. So the finite element method reduces our two-point boundary value problem to a linear system, the same as what we obtained uh, last time with the finite difference method. The difference now is that we apply another, uh, another idea, uh, the idea of collocation, uh, to get to the linear system that we solve. If we solve linear systems, uh, then uh, we remember from our earliest chapter on linear algebra that the application of orthogonality leads to more accurate results. And that's what we will do here too. We will apply an orthogonal basis of functions when we apply the collocation method. Uh, so at the end of the lecture, we will see that it can give dramatically more accurate results uh, with the same amount of work. Um, we had a chapter on approximation, uh, data fitting and interpolating. Well, at the end of that chapter, we covered splines uh, as a geometric manner, as a geometric way uh, to uh, approximate functions. Here we will use the piecewise linear uh, B-splines um, to create an orthogonal basis of uh, functions that will be used to solve our two-point boundary value. When we solve linear systems in the least square sense, we require that the residual vector is perpendicular to the basis. And that will also be the way how the Galerkin method works. Uh, so the Galerkin method will set up a candidate solution and then require that the candidate solution makes a residual that is orthogonal to the basis. So we will illustrate this on two linear uh, boundary value problems. So here is the idea. Uh, first problem. Uh, so we have a two-point boundary value problem given by a second-order differential equation defined by a right-hand side function in the independent variable x, the dependent variable y, and its first derivative. In the numerical solution, uh, we are approximating the solution y in finitely many points. So we always have a grid. So the idea here with collocation is that we will require or we will assume that our solution takes the shape of a particular uh, function expressed in basis functions. Um, so if we have n points, uh, so here uh, counting from 1 is again perhaps more convenient. If we have n points, then we can work with n basis functions. The basis functions are what we uh, decide to work with. The unknowns that we compute are the coefficients for uh, the basis functions. So the inputs uh, are the, um, the gridding, um, also the right-hand side where we can evaluate uh, the differential equation, and then we have our unknown coefficients. Um, so the idea is to, and you, you can see that uh, the n dimension, n is here important, uh, the n coincide with uh, the coefficients, the number of basis functions, and the number of grid points. And we will substitute the candidate solution. So in 
written as a linear combination of the basis functions, we will substitute this in the differential equation. And if the differential equation is linear, then we will obtain a linear series. Let's do it. Uh, let's do it on a test uh, problem that we have used before. Um, so it is a problem is linear. Uh, so again, uh, to decide whether a problem is linear, look at the right hand side. Here, uh, the right hand side is a very simple right hand side, four times y. The y appears linearly, no power, no, uh, not in the argument of some other function. So this is a linear problem. Previously, we have shown that e to the power 2x, so the exponential in 2x and the exponential in minus 2x are the two basis functions. And with the boundary values uh, 1 and 3 in the interval 0, 1, we can compute the exact solution. So this is a very nice test problem uh, to test our numerical method. Uh, we have a grid, so now here it is actually written in the opposite way. So we work in the standard basis of polynomials. Polynomials are very nice functions. So why not take the first five uh, basis functions? So notice here, I said we, we, we have it differently. Normally, we actually decide on the uh, gridding, and then we pick uh the, the 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 number of basis elements so here we did it differently we go up to four and here we also go up to four uh now you can see that i've flipped uh the notation now again with polynomials it's uh nicer to start at zero for the constant coefficient has power zero in the unknown so the number five is the number of basis functions that we use. It's also the number of points in our subdivision of the interval 0, 1. Knowing actually already that this will be reduced to a problem in three variables, as here we actually know what is y not is 1 and y 4 is 3. This will lead to a linear system. And where have we seen this again? Uh, well, uh, remember doing interpolation via a linear system. Um, so uh, here we observe that if we plug in the boundary value conditions, we actually obtain linear linear equations in the unknown coefficients. So this happens with the boundary value and also happens uh, with any interior point. So for any x1, we do have the powers of the x1, but the x1 is a number. So what is not known are the uh, coefficients. So what is important here in this slide is the linearity. So we have a linear system, a linear system in the coefficients of the basis functions. So this, and you can see that this actually eliminates already C1. So uh, the, the first boundary condition is very special. Um, it says that uh, why y at 0 equals 1, and we have a polynomial. This makes that the constant coefficient has to be 1. Um, so in, in a way, if we compute something, uh, that's important. Um, now, we have to impose the differential equation on the um, candidate solution. We have to take the left hand side and the left hand side appears with the two derivatives so we will um, take uh, the first derivative and the second derivative so and that gives us 
a condition on the coefficients. Um, so we have the left side, which is obtained after taking the derivative twice of our candidate solution. And then we have the right hand side, which is multiplying the candidate solution by four. So the four comes from the right hand side here. So we have the four, four times, four times here. If we regroup everything, so the X doesn't really matter here. The X is uh, a number. Uh, so the X is part of the coefficient. Uh, so we have one equation here for any X, for any number X. For any number X, we do have the equations, the type of the, the shape of the linear equation that needs to be solved. Uh, what is fixed here in our example is the other four. Um, so the other four here is the last coefficient. It's the degree of the polynomial. Um, so it's a little bit unfortunate that there are two different fours here. Um, but the uh, four, uh, the limited number of intervals, um, and again, uh, the, like we did last time, uh, the dimension will be three. Uh, so we will end up with three interior points. Um, so depending whether we work again with, uh, a, so here we work with the Dirichlet problem, but if we have a von Neumann problem, we would again uh, have to work with uh, these finite differences to eliminate uh, the exterior points. Um, so and that then would give a five-dimensional problem. So we have three, we have one general equation that we write for any x, and then we formulate it for uh, the three interior points. Uh, so the y1, the y2, the y3. Uh, the, the main difference with finite differences here is that we do not solve directly for y1, y2, y3, we solve for the coefficients of the degree four polynomial, that is the candidate solution. So the, we obtain a linear system which contains the powers of x. Uh, so remember from interpolation, the van der Monde matrix. And in, in a way, this is doing interpolation, uh, but then in a, then in a more general sense. So that's why we call it collocation. A system of uh, here five equations in five unknowns, uh, although we can directly essentially eliminate C naught as one. Uh, here this is not done. Uh, so it might be better to consider the entire system. So let's do this. Um, so for we here is the setup in our experiment. We have values for x1, x2, x3. So we have a numerical coefficient matrix. Here it's still given in symbolic form, but we have a matrix of numbers that will be the coefficient matrix in the linear system. And it's important to realize that this gives us the coefficients in a polynomial, uh, a polynomial that we will evaluate, and then we will compare the values at this polynomial with the values that we obtain at the points in the, uh, in the exact solution. So it's collocation is not interpolation. The setup is defined by a Julia function. Um, it's important uh, that we get uh, the setup right with the step size, um, because the H is used uh, to determine the grid points. Um, so we start with the internal points. Uh, the dimension is the dimension of the linear algebra problem. 
so in our example, the dimension is five. So we will solve a five by five system. Um, starting with the first equation uh, consists of the uh, one on the row and the rest is all zeros. Uh, we fill up uh, the system. Um, so it's a little bit strange that for five points, uh, we had a very particular uh, formulation. In general, we have the result of our quartic here. Um, and then we have the, um, so this should be still an error. So we actually have more coefficients um, that show up. So this is actually not quite right. Um, so, and then we have the uh, derivatives, the coefficients that come from the uh, derivatives. Um, uh, I'm sorry, it is right. So if we take uh, the derivatives, uh, we have the uh, derivatives that come from the first uh, term, taking the derivative twice, and then we have the other derivatives that come into play. All right. Um, let's run this for five points. Uh, for five points, this is already quite accurate. Um, so uh, we have a spacing uh, that is um, one over four. Uh, so, um, and we get an accuracy of 10 to the power three, 10 to the power minus four. Um, so for a small problem, this works. Um, or however, uh, we have seen that uh, the basis of standard polynomials is actually not a very good basis, not a very good basis to interpolate in. Um, it's better to work if we work with interpolation to use the Chebyshev points. And I've seen with Gaussian quadrature, uh, Chebyshev polynomials appear again with their tridiagonal system uh, as an orthogonal basis. So here, uh, this is collocation. We will not explore all this further, but one can also do approximation with uh, sine and cosine functions uh, and also construct an orthogonal basis uh, in that way. Um, so polynomials, um, while nice functions, certainly for low degrees, are not particularly suitable for higher degrees and also not really suitable to capture uh, periodic uh, data. Okay, so what will we then use? Uh, so let's first uh, do an exercise. So here, this is the same exercise, the same two point boundary value problem that we used uh, last time. Um, so the right hand side is, is a linear function in X. So we can compute the exact quadratic solution uh, to this uh, differential equation. So we can compare then the numerical solution solved with collocation with the um, solution that is, um, so we can compare the exact solution to the numerical solution. And here do this for five, um, see how good the solution is. Here actually, it, it may be quite good because the exact solution is a polynomial. Um, so it might be uh, an interesting result if you would recover the exact uh, polynomial. Um, so in, in, in a way, um, I was downplaying uh, the use of the standard basis, but if your solution is actually a polynomial, if your right-hand side is only in x, then, or, or x square or x to the power three, if your right hand side is a polynomial, then the polynomial basis might be quite good. Let's consider another basis. Um, so we will get the finite element method if we, in the collocation method, we use splines. 
Um, so we encountered cubic splines uh, before. Here we will use a more uh, a basis of spline functions that is much more simpler. And um, the formulas here may remind you of the Lagrange polynomials. Uh, the Lagrange polynomials of degree one, if you work with one point. Um, so we have the general formulas for the intermediate uh, basis functions and the basis functions at the end are uh, kind of special. So the uh, what is important here is the range. Um, so we have the zero equals otherwise, which is common in all definitions. So we divide our interval in points and, and notice that uh, with, with, with splines we call them nodes. Um, so the, 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 but it's okay to look at it in two intervals. So the first spline function only lives uh, in the first interval. The last spline function only lives in the last interval. And in general, uh, we have that any general uh, function, so there is the i here, the i basis function is actually centered at the i node. So it lives to the left of the node and to the right of the node. Uh, but it's otherwise it is zero. Um, here you see the plot of uh, the um, basis functions. Uh, notice for example, focus at the middle. So the x2, so the blue uh, function is centered at x2 and goes up from x1 to 1, from 0 to 1 at the left, and then goes down from 1 to 0, from x2 to x3. So it's a tent-shaped function. Um, and it's also the same property that we had with the Lagrange uh, polynomials. Uh, they are local, uh, so they are switched on and off. Um, so we are going to do some type of interpolation here as well. Um, so we have now our candidate solution, which is a linear combination of these tense shape basis function. So we call it a piecewise linear B-spline. Uh, observe that uh, the property of interpolation. Uh, so uh, with the coefficients last time, we computed the coefficients of a polynomial. But here actually the coefficients are values of the functions that we are computing. So uh, this is a consequence of this uh, tent-shaped uh, property of the basis functions. So the basis functions at the nodes, they are either off or on. And this implies that if you evaluate one of the nodes in the candidate function, then only one of the basis functions will remain. So that was the same idea with Lagrange interpolation. So we have we are applying collocation now but with a special basis so that we interpolating the data so collocation was not the same as interpolation except if you use a very special basis that's fine but we have more um, we have orthogonality um, so we touched on the orthogonality of functions when we discussed Gaussian quadrature, in particular with the Chebyshev polynomials. 
the orthogonality is always relative, is defined with respect to an inner product. So we work with an inner product over the interval AB, where our two point boundary value problem is defined. And then the integral of the product of two functions defines an inner product. And with the inner product, we can talk about orthogonality. So orthogonality, two functions are orthogonal if their inner product equals zero. Why does this matter? Well, this matters because our piecewise linear spline function, so the basis, they form an orthogonal basis with respect to this inner product. And this can be very easily verified if you multiply the first and the third uh, basis function, then you can see it in the picture. Uh, the first uh, function is only defined on this interval, x0 to x1. And the second basis function, so perhaps let me now appropriately use blue, the second basis function is only defined on x1 to x3. So if you make the product over the entire interval AB, then the product will be zero, and therefore the integral is zero. And this also happens for all the other basis functions. So here with our simple basis of five basis functions, we can exhaustively enumerate all the possible choices for which we have zeros. Um, so there is a lot of orthogonality. I said that uh, the, the basis was orthogonal, but that was actually not quite right. So we have x1, uh, so the, the, the ba second basis function with uh, the, the third basis functions. So there is this uh, way where they overlap. But in general, we have the orthogonality between basis functions that differ more or more than one in their index. So we have this uh, property here, we have this verified. What does this mean for the candidate basis uh, function? Um, so when we do the inner product of uh, the candidate function, our piecewise linear B-spline function, when we make the inner product with the base functions, you will see that for any j, there will be only three functions that remain. So in solving this exercise, you apply the property on the last line of uh, the previous slide. So the term that remains is j equals i, j equals i minus one, provided that j is larger than one, or the term for j equals i plus one. Again, provided that j is uh, less than n plus one. So the solution to the exercise is that you have a three terms uh, left. All right, so we have our basis, uh, and we have a basis that uh, gives the orthogonality. Um, so orthogonality and three terms uh, relations um, are related. Uh, so Chebyshev polynomials, they were subject to a three terms relation. So here our candidate functions are also, when we multiply, when we do the inner products with the basis functions, we also get a three terms recursion. And we will exploit this. We will get tri-diagonal systems. There is one more element that we need. Uh, so uh, that's to make the Galerkin method. Um, so we had the finite element method. Um, this happens whenever you use splines as your basis. 
But uh, Galerkin imposes another condition. So we are looking for a function and a function that when we substitute our candidate solution inside uh, the differential equation, we want then the residual to be as small as possible. So, and to be as small as possible um, is equivalent to requiring or forcing that the residual is orthogonal to the basis. Um, where does that requirement, why does that requirement uh, look so familiar to us? Well, that was the same requirement or the same property that we had when we were solving in the least square sense. Uh, so in the least square sense, when we solve an overdetermined linear system, we can't really make things zero. But what we can make zero, and what would be zero if we solved in the least square sense, is that the residual vector is perpendicular to the basis. And that will be our requirement here. Um, so our differential equation is replaced by the integral equation at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so we are uh, doing, we are solving differential equations by applying integration, uh, also a way you could see it, uh, although we will derive um, the uh, tri-diagonal linear system that comes out of this. Um, it, so the orthogonality is key. So uh, this will lead to more accurate solutions. Uh, what is also important is that um, you realize that uh, these two conditions are indeed equivalent. Um, and it's important to know what are the unknowns here. We have here n plus 1, or actually n plus 2 basis functions. And here we also have uh, n plus 1 conditions. So the i, which runs from 0 to n plus 1, is also the same i that runs through uh, the conditions here. So we will have here n plus 2 conditions on the coefficients. So what will remain in the lecture now is the setup of a tridiagonal linear system. Okay, so what we will do is that um, we will out uh, the integrals. Um, we will what what we actually want is that we want to get the right hand side in there. Uh, I mean, the right hand side is already in there. Uh, but we will first eliminate uh, the second derivatives of the uh, candidate solution by integration by parts. Uh, so we have the first uh, derivatives coming in. Uh, we also have the values of the basis functions. So integration by parts, uh, so applying the integration by parts gives us uh, an equation where we integrate our uh, right-hand side function, uh, multiplied again with the basis. Um, so let's, so what we actually after, and perhaps it's not clear that this is a simplification, uh, but notice that what we actually are really after are conditions, <coughs> conditions on the unknown coefficients in the candidate solution. So that's actually what matters here. So let's not lose uh, sight of this. We want to find linear equations in the unknown coefficients. Let's see what happens. Uh, what we find at the left-hand side, so after the integration by parts, we find that we have a sum of inner products multiplied with the uh, unknown coefficients. Uh, so we have an extra property here. Um, 
So the derivatives of our um, functions, <clears throat> so we, we have the orthogonality of uh, the basis, but that actually also extends on the derivatives. Um, so what are the derivatives of the tense-shaped functions? Uh, the derivatives are step functions. So uh, let me explain this. Uh, so the proof here is that if we have our access system, uh, then what, how do the derivatives look like? Well, the tenth shape functions, they are increasing with a constant slope one to the left and they go with a constant slope negative one at the right. So this is for uh, the xi. So uh, the derivative actually doesn't uh, exist uh, at, the, at the node itself, but don't worry about this. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, what matters is that also the derivatives are short-lived. Uh, the derivatives are zero elsewhere, uh, everywhere outside uh, the interval one point to the left and one point to the right. So we have the same property as the second exercise. And why is that important? This property ensures, and let me make this again for the right, so we will end up with tridiagonal matrices. Uh, for linear algebra compared to the standard basis, this is already a big advantage. Tridiagonal matrices are uh, much nicer to deal with than general dense matrices. All right, let's now uh, look how we can use this. So let's apply this to our running example. Uh, we have four intervals, um, three unknowns. Um, so we will work out all the conditions, um, all the conditions on this very specific basis for this uh, step size, uh, one over four. So the formulas um, are applied. Well, here they are again. So the basis functions uh, they are now simplified, so perhaps I didn't notice it right away either. So what we are using is that we are using an equidistant uh, distribution of the points. So that simplifies uh, the basis functions. Um, we have the derivatives of uh, the basis functions. So and actually I was wrong by saying that it's negative 1, 1. Uh, so it depends on the 1 over h and the minus 1 over h. Uh, um, but the, the, the main issue remains, uh, so also the derivatives are short functions. So they are supported on a narrow range. Um, the range centered, um, so centered uh, with the xi here, so the i corresponds to the index. So what, what do we need the derivatives for again? Well, we have the equation, uh, the tridiagonal equations in the left-hand side. Um, so the left-hand side uh, needs the, the derivatives, uh, needs the products of the derivatives. So it looks involved, uh, but these integrals are very easy to evaluate. Um, and if you are in doubt of this, well, um, I, I would say apply SymPy. But you see that the integral inter intervals, uh, the xi minus 1 and the xi, um, are independent of the h. Um, so the h is a constant here. Um, and we see the h coming up as the length of the interval again. So we use from in evaluating this derivative, this, this inner product here, we use the fact that uh, the shortness of the basis. 
So the interval AB can be reduced to the interval XI minus 1 to XI. And uh, what are we computing again? We are computing the coefficient in front of CI. Uh, so we have a tridiagonal system. So we have the diagonal element. So this 2 over H will be the diagonal. Uh, compute the same. Um, so I will not do this here. Uh, the same for the off-diagonal elements. Uh, so the off-diagonal elements are uh, formed with the i plus 1, the derivatives of the i plus 1 and the i minus 1 because of symmetry. So what do we obtain? Uh, we have the uh, the left side that has the constants here, and then we have the y sitting in. So here we are applying, so it may go a little bit fast here, but here we are applying that the right-hand side, our function f, is so simple because we have a linear problem. So we are just substituting uh, the underlined, the double underlined here is the 4 times y, uh, so I should also include the y here, uh, the, the 4. So the right hand side is quite simple. Uh, so we had the equation that we obtained after the integration by parts. This is the equation now again. But now it is made very explicit. So we have explicit values for the inner products of the derivatives. So the diagonal elements are 2 over h. The other elements, the off-diagonal elements, are minus 1 over h. So you see we have again a diagonally dominant um, system. So we have i and i plus 1, or i minus 1 and i because of the symmetry. So we can actually now formulate uh, the entire system and um, formulate this as a linear system in the CIs. Um, so again, the property that we have with exercise 2 uh, matters a lot. So we have... ...coefficient matrix. We have the C0 and the Cn plus 1, for which we will be using uh, boundary value conditions. All right, uh, so here it is then. Um, the equations for the linear system depend on two parameters. Uh, so we have the 2h and the minus 1 of h, so the 2 over h and the minus 1 over h, and then we have the terms that come from the right hand side, the, the 4 times y. So they are operated by that. And then we use the boundary value conditions uh, that appear. Um, and we have the uh, your system that solved. Here is the example um, for the same problem. So actually what we are computing are values. Uh, and we can see that we have two to three decimal places correct as well. So you can see this by uh, comparing uh, values. Um, you can see this by looking at the errors. So absolute, um, so more decimal, uh, we appear to have more decimal places where the uh, numbers are smaller or, or larger. So about the same accuracy here for five points, uh, no problem about this. So well, in the third exercise and last exercise here, you will apply again to the exact solution. And set up the linear system that must be solved. You will obtain also here 
fly diagonal system. Um, the the, the, the right-hand side will be different. Uh, uh, the the right-hand side, uh, so that, that's important to know. Uh, the, 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 the linear system, so the coefficient matrix of the linear system will be on because we have no y in the right-hand side. Uh, so the right-hand sides are the um, multiples of the x values, um, and these are constants. So the, the, the triangular system is actually easier to set up. All right, so what is now the point? If we run this for 100 points, uh, so then collocation with the standard basis doesn't really improve much. Um, um, so we still get the 10 to the power minus 3. With the Galerkin method, we can actually get one order better, so two orders better. Um, so the between minus 3, 10 to the power minus 3, 10 to the power minus 5. Um, so the outliers are added in, so the 10 to the power minus 15 are the outliers. Uh, but for the Galerkin method, we see the errors range between 10 to the power minus 5, 10 to the power minus 7. Two minutes to conclude. Um, the three lectures that we have covered. Um, so we started two lectures ago uh, with boundary value problems, reducing the boundary values to initial value problems and making important distinction between linear boundary value problems and nonlinear boundary value problems. We have to shoot twice uh, to get the actual solution accurately for linear boundary value problems. For nonlinear boundary value problems, uh, we apply linear interpolation to get the secret method, quadratic interpolation to continue our root finding process. So for nonlinear problems, we solve actually a root finding problems. Um, with finite differences on two point boundary value problems, so we had one fixed equation that we always applied to the left-hand side and also to get a tri-diagonal system out of there. Uh, we get a linear system for linear problems. Um, when things get more nonlinear, uh, when we can solve eigenvalue problems, well, uh, that's for certain uh, boundary values that have a parameter in them. Um, in for general nonlinear boundary value problem, uh, we can apply Newton's method uh, in several variables. So today we ended with Galerkin method that applies, also reduces the problem to a linear uh, problem, but applies uh, collocation. Um, so we have actually two things computed at once. We have uh, the that are the values, but we actually also have a function. So the main thing that I probably did not forget to point out is that the function, the coefficients that we are using, will actually also be very good for all the intermediate points. Um, so we have solved two problems essentially at once. Uh, we have the value problem that we had with interpolation have the coefficient problem. The coefficient problem that we used in our, our interpolation. So Galerkin does a little bit the same what Newton interpolation, uh, what the Newton method with the divided difference method did for the interpolation. And the orthogonality also leads to a more accurate result.